Good morning, church family. Happy Independence Day. (coughs) It is right and good to thank our Lord and our sovereign God for the freedoms that we have enjoyed here in this country. Let us never idolize our country or anything like that, but always give thanks to God, the creator, the sovereign Lord of all the universe for the gifts that he has given us. That is a good thing to do especially the freedom to do what we're doing right now, to gather here publicly, openly, to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ as the name above all names, and to worship God. May we never take it for granted. May we understand this gift that we have been given by God's grace. And may we also seek to preserve it. Even if God in his sovereignty removes these freedoms, may we continue to be faithful, even if we should ever face opposition even in our own country. God is faithful. He will preserve his church, but let us also be good stewards of the civic freedoms with which he has blessed us. Please turn with me in your copy of God's word to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. In your pew Bibles, that is page 1159. Last week, remember, we talked about how before we became Christians, we were not just broken or lost, but we were dead We were dead in our trespasses and sins, and dead people can't do anything. So we remained dead until something happened. But God happened. He came in. We were dead, but God made us alive together in Christ. We need to keep this fresh in our minds this week as we get into today's passage because it's going to be absolutely necessary to always remember we were dead, but God if we're going to understand what Paul and the Holy Spirit through the pen of Paul has for us today. Today we're going to see some of the big words, the key words of our faith, words like salvation and grace and faith. We're going to talk about what these words mean and also what they don't mean. We're going to look at some of the grand doctrines of the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation 500 years ago, the doctrine of what's known as sola gratia, salvation by grace alone. Sola fide, salvation through faith alone. Soli deo gloria, glory to God alone. We're going to talk about what's known as the doctrines of grace, the five points of Reformed theology. We're going to be talking about some big concepts today. We're going to be getting kind of into the weeds. We're going to be talking about some heady ideas. But remember, everything that God has in his word is for all of us. It's for all of us. It's not just for pastors or theologians. It's for everyone. So by God's grace and by his Holy Spirit, let's dive in. Let's read Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1 and reading through verse 10. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes this. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Heavenly Father, open our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit. May we receive and understand what you have for us in your word and make us more like your Son, Jesus Christ, through it. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. So first, right off the bat, we're going to start in verse 8 this week. By grace you have been saved. 
by grace. Well, what is grace? We use this word all the time. We use this word to describe being nice to people, being kind. We use it to describe the movement of a dancer across the stage. Grace, biblically speaking, is not a substance. It's not a thing. But it's a way to describe God's unmerited favor. For this part of this sermon this morning, I am indebted to the book Grace Alone by the theologian Carl Truman, and I highly recommend it to you if you're interested in further study and further reading. Grace describes God's attitude towards his creation. Reformed theology distinguishes between two aspects of God's gracious attitude towards his creation. First, we we talk about what's called common grace. Common grace is God's unmerited favor toward all people, not in a saving way, not in related to salvation, but in the sense that all people, saved and unsaved, Christian and unchristian, experience certain benefits of God's favor, such as the general restraint of evil in the world, the ability to grow food, to conduct business, to marry, to have children, to have friendships, and on and on. These are things that are not unique to Christians but are still aspects of God's grace. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, described it this way, He, that is God the Father, makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. All people everywhere are the recipients of God's common grace. The freedoms that we enjoy as citizens of this nation, that is an amazing example of God's common grace. The right to assemble and worship Freely is indeed an example of God's grace. The fact that freedom exists here and is extended to all within our borders, Christian and non-Christian alike, and the fact that God has sovereignly preserved this freedom for us through the years and through our national moral decline, what better way to describe that as God's grace, his undeserved favor? Praise him for his common grace. May he continue to shed his grace on us, on our country, even though we do not deserve it. So common grace is extended to all people by God, but then saving grace or special grace is God's power, his saving power that he works in those whom he has chosen for salvation in Jesus Christ. Remember, we talked about the Father's election in eternity past the Son's redemption and the Spirit's sealing. Only those who are saved can be said to be the recipients, the recipients of God's saving or special grace. Notice that both common grace and special grace are still undeserved. It's still unmerited favor. They're, still, they're different in the extent and the application, but they're still undeserved. Grace, no matter what category it falls into, grace, by definition, is undeserved, and it is dependent, in fact, upon human sinfulness. Think about that. We talked about this a little bit last week. After Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, God would have been perfectly just and righteous to destroy them right then and there, but he didn't. He showed grace. He showed them undeserved favor. He showed them mercy. If humanity had never fallen into sin we would not know God as gracious. Think about that. Ponder that. God is necessarily relational within himself. We've talked about this as well. The Father, the Son, the Spirit are perfectly happy, perfectly joyful in their relationships with one another. And God created the world, remember, out of the overflow of his own joy and his own happiness in his existence. But the Father doesn't need to show grace to the Son. The Son doesn't need to show mercy to the Spirit. The Son obeys the Father perfectly in all things. But after our first parents sinned, they committed cosmic treason against God, and they plunged all of creation into a state of sin, God chose to show mercy. He chose to show grace. He chose to define his relationship with his creation by grace, by undeserved favor. He restrained his wrath. He provided the way for reconciliation with him. And so now our relationship with God is defined by 
grace. Saved and unsaved alike, believer and unbeliever, no matter which of the two identities we have, we're still utterly dependent upon God's undeserved favor for our very existence. This is how God revealed himself to Moses at Mount Sinai. He said, I have, he said the, the, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. God defines himself as merciful and gracious, which are really two very similar terms for what we are talking about this morning. It was only by God's grace that Adam and Eve lived. It was only by God's grace that Abraham was the one chosen for the covenant in Genesis 15. It was only by God's grace that he chose Israel as his people. It was only by God's grace today that God still restrains his wrath. He allows sinful men and women to continue living in open rebellion against him. That is an act of God's grace, beloved. Again, Carl Truman puts it this way. He says, in the face of human sin and rebellion, the Lord has chosen not to exact justice as he is entitled to do. He has chosen instead to be gracious and merciful. In other words, he has chosen to show unmerited favor towards those who do not deserve it. You can't deserve grace by definition. You can't earn mercy. It's only grace if you don't deserve it. Paul puts such an emphasis on this in this passage. He says it twice. Here in verse 8 and earlier, we looked at it briefly last week in verse 5. For by grace you have been saved. Remember, he's talking to believers here. He's talking to the saints, Jews and Gentiles together. Those who were dead in their trespasses and sins, but now have been made alive by God. God's attitude towards sinful humanity is defined by grace, but his action toward those towards us whom he has chosen for salvation is defined by saving grace. Adam and Eve deserve death. All of their descendants are by nature children of wrath, dead in trespasses and sins. But remember last week, but God. God takes those whom he has predestined and elected and sealed and applies his special saving grace to them, bringing them from death to life so that they are then enabled and and empowered to respond to that grace. And how do we do that? Paul tells us right there, through faith. We are saved by grace through faith. Faith is the response of God's elect people to God's saving grace. The response that we have when we hear the gospel after our hearts have been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. The reformers, and many since then, have said that faith is the instrument by which we lay hold of justification, of being saved, of being declared righteous in God's eyes, not on our merit, but on the finished work of Jesus Christ alone on our behalf. We live by faith. Faith is how we live. Habakkuk said this, the righteous shall live by his faith. Paul used this in Romans chapter 1 and Galatians chapter 3. And really, everybody lives by faith in some sense. We all do, don't we? You had faith when you got in your car that it would start up and it would get you here this morning. You're having faith right now that the pew that you're sitting in isn't going to collapse or vanish into thin air. This isn't the kind of faith that Paul is talking about here, though. Just like we had to distinguish between common grace and saving grace, so too we have to distinguish between everyday faith like that and saving faith. And it may come as a shock to you to hear this, but... You have to exercise saving faith in order to be saved. Paul in Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Or think of when Paul and Silas in the book of Acts were sitting in jail in Philippi and there was an earthquake that broke down the doors and loosed their chains. The jailer came to them in fear and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? you remember their response? They said this, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and all your household. Believing in Jesus means just that. To believe in Jesus means to exercise that saving faith, to lay hold of God's saving grace 
And so then, now, it is very tempting because we are told and commanded to exercise faith in Jesus, to express that saving faith, to grab hold of God's grace by faith. It's very tempting to think of faith as something that we do. And yes, we are, in a sense, it is something that we do. So maybe a better category would be, uh, it's very tempting to think of faith as a work. Something that's benefit, something that's, uh, that, that is beneficial or meritorious on our part. Something that's independent of God's grace. Something that we can take credit for. Nothing could be further from the truth. Look at Paul's immediate response. He's a smart guy. He anticipates our natural reaction here. As soon as he says this, by grace you have been saved through faith, he says, this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. That very faith that we are commanded to exercise, the faith by which we lay hold of God's grace, is itself a gift from God. Paul knows the human condition, and of course, more so the Holy Spirit knows our human condition. He knows that as soon as he says that we have to do something, our natural instinct is going to be to take credit for it, isn't it? We want to brag about it. But remember, what can dead people do? Nothing. Dead people can't do anything. God could extend his sovereign saving grace to us all day long, but if we were still to remain dead in our trespasses and sins, as Paul describes in verses 1 through 3, we wouldn't be able to respond to God's saving grace with saving faith. We're dead. Can't do anything. In order for us to be able to respond, we first have to be made alive again. And that's what we talked about last week. Verses 4 and 5, but God, being rich in mercy, raised us up. He made us alive together with Christ. We have to first be made alive in order to respond to God's saving grace with saving faith. And the $5 word for that is regeneration, to be made new, to be given new life, God's life, resurrection life. In Reformed theology, you may know, be familiar with the doctrines of grace or the so-called five points of Calvinism, often called by the acronym TULIP, T-U-I-L-P. The I in TULIP stands for irresistible grace, but I think a more accurate term might be effectual calling, but then you don't have a nifty flower-related acronym, but what are you going to do? The idea behind this doctrine is that when God bestows his saving grace on an individual, that is, when an individual is called from death to life, is called out of darkness into light, then that grace is indeed saving grace. God's grace is effective. It cannot fail to work. It cannot fail to effect salvation in that individual. God's saving grace can only result in that person responding with saving faith. God's call, his specific call to individual men and women unto salvation is only given to the elect. Those whom he has chosen and predestined in eternity past, those whom the Son has redeemed and the Spirit has sealed. Paul is talking here to the elect, the saints, the chosen ones, Jews and Gentiles together, He's not talking to the general, about the general call of preaching the gospel to all people. He's talking about and to those who have been effectually called by God. Are you still with me? This is important stuff. God bestows his saving grace upon those whom he has chosen, and those whom he has chosen cannot fail to respond to his saving grace with saving faith. Praise the Lord for that. That's why Paul says, this is not your own doing. From a human standpoint, we have to work. We have to exercise faith. But from an eternal standpoint, from God's standpoint, the faith that we exercise is itself a gift from God. If we could take credit in any way for our faith, then it would indeed be a work, a meritorious act, something by which we could say to God, hey, God, look what I did. Aren't I great? Aren't I special? Now give me your mercy, Lord. I've earned it. I did the thing you said I had to do. Give me that grace. And then also we could turn around and say, not to God, but to other people, why can't you be more like me? I managed to believe. 
Why can't you? Just get your act together. Just try harder. May it never be so. May it never be so with us, beloved. All kinds of boasting or bragging or even false modesty or humble brag, as people younger than me tend to say. All of it is excluded. We contribute nothing to our salvation except the sin that makes it necessary. Last week, remember, we also talked about Lazarus. We talked about how absurd it would have been for Jesus to stand outside Lazarus' tomb and act like a cheerleader just to give Lazarus a TED Talk. It wouldn't work. No, Jesus issued a command. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus didn't raise himself from the dead. He was utterly and completely dependent upon Jesus' resurrection power to give him life. But then once he had been given life, what did he do? Did he keep on acting like a dead man? Did he stay there in the tomb in those clothes? Of course not. He got up. He came out. He followed Jesus. He didn't have a choice about being given that new life. He didn't have a choice about what to do with his newly given life. He was dependent upon Jesus to give him life. And so too, the strength by which Lazarus stood up and walked out of that tomb was itself a gift from God. Lazarus couldn't take any credit. He couldn't take any claim that he deserved Jesus to raise him from the dead. All the credit, all the glory goes to God and God alone. This is what is meant by the doctrine soli Deo Gloria, all glory to God and God alone. We mentioned earlier that this passage contains key words like grace and faith and these these doctrines of the Protestant Reformation. In the last few decades, beloved, there has been a push by the Roman Catholic Church to minimize these differences. It certainly would be nice. It certainly would be nice to see them repent of their false teaching and be reconciled to God and to us. And it can be tricky because they use a lot of the same words that we do. The problem is that they mean something vastly different by the way they use these words. For the Roman Catholics, grace isn't simply a term to describe God's unmerited favor towards his creation, but it's a thing. It's a substance, a spiritual substance that human beings need. It's something that's infused into our nature at baptism which, according to them, washes away our original sin and it enables us to begin obeying God's commands. But it must be accompanied with a life of faith as exercise is continually doing works of penance and contrition. It's very common to hear them affirm things that sound very good to our ears. They affirm salvation by grace through faith. But that's absolutely not what we affirm because it's not what the Bible teaches We affirm salvation by grace alone. We affirm salvation by faith alone. Salvation is only the result of God's unmerited favor towards us in Jesus Christ. Our response to God's saving grace is itself a gift of God. The inevitable response of the work of the Holy Spirit in regenerating our hearts, the only possible outcome of being brought from death to life by God and God alone. Beloved, as soon as you hear of grace being infused to us, red flags should be going off in your mind. We don't have some foreign substance infused to us that then gets started on the road of doing good works in order to remain in a state of grace, in order to remain in God's good favor. No! We look back to the cross. We look back to the finished work of Jesus Christ at Calvary. Once for all, there at Calvary, our sin, the sin of all his elect people, was laid on him. He took the punishment of God's wrath in our stead. It is finished. Our redemption is accomplished. Our sins are paid for. But we have also been given his righteousness. We have his perfect obedience to God the Father credited to us. That's what it means to be justified. We are justified in God's sight. We're counted as righteous not because of any work that we have done, including faith, but only on the basis of Christ and his righteousness then imputed to us on our behalf. Infusion, no. Imputation, yes, because that's how God in his word describes it. 
Our sin was imputed to Jesus on the cross, counted as if it was his when it was ours. That's what imputation means. His righteousness is then imputed to us, counted as ours when it's really his. When our hearts are regenerated by the Holy Spirit, when we respond in faith to God's grace, he became sin for our sake. He became sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Martin Luther called this the great exchange. He used this Latin phrase, simul justus et peccator, which means at the same time, just and a sinner. That's who we are. In ourselves, we are sinful and undeserving of God's grace, but in Christ, we are counted as righteous. We have been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That faith itself is a gift of God. It's not the result of anything we've done. Look how Paul describes it then in verse 10. He says, we are his workmanship. Hallelujah. What a savior. All glory to God alone. He has made us. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Now, some of you are probably saying, Pastor, why bother with all this technical stuff? Why bother with any of this? Aren't you just splitting hairs? Aren't you just being pedantic? What difference does any of this really make? The difference, beloved, is nothing less than eternity itself. Charles Spurgeon was called the Prince of Preachers. He once said that discernment is not just the ability to tell right from wrong, but the ability to tell right from almost right. That's what we are called to do as the people of God. The enemy is sneaky, the enemy is smart. He's smarter than you, he's much, much smarter than me. He loves to twist our words against us, and he especially loves to twist God's word against him. The difference in being saved by grace and being saved by grace alone is not merely the difference between Protestants and Catholics. No, it's the difference between Christianity and every other world religion. It's the difference between salvation by grace and salvation by works. It's the difference between the gospel of Jesus Christ and every other false gospel that is out there. And there are many false gospels out there today. It's the difference between being saved by God and saved by ourselves. Who would you choose in that equation? It's the difference between heaven and hell. It's the difference between salvation and damnation. We are saved by grace alone. Unfortunately, this often results in the charge being leveled against us as Protestants, and especially as Reformed Protestants, that we presume upon God's grace. That we don't worry about doing good works because we don't have to earn God's grace. Sadly, there are groups of people who have done this, who have taken this attitude. But just because we don't do anything to earn God's grace, that doesn't mean we can just keep on living however we want. God doesn't save us. God doesn't bring us from death to life just so that we can keep living like dead men. Just so we can keep living in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, living like sons of disobedience and children of wrath. No, we have a new calling now. Verse 10, Paul says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand. Paul has just finished emphasizing the fact that we don't get to take any credit for our faith or our salvation. Remember too, Paul spent verses 1 through 7, we looked at last week, describing our status first as dead and then being made alive by God. We are God's workmanship, his creation in Christ Jesus. Not just in the sense of existing as human beings, but being a new creation in Christ. Remember the key to the whole book of Ephesians, in Christ. Second Corinthians, Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. God is creating himself, creating for himself a new humanity, not with Adam as our head, but with Jesus Christ as our head. The church, we are his body, the saints. He isn't just raising us from physical death only to die again like Lazarus, blessed though he was to to be the recipient of such an amazing miracle. He's not just resurrecting us. He's recreating us 
He's reconstituting us. He holds the power of life itself. Once we are new creations, we can't keep living like before. Pastor John MacArthur puts it this way. Before we can do any good work for the Lord, he has to do his good work in us. Once God has done his good work in us, once, once he has brought us from death to life, once he had bestowed his saving grace on us, what do we do? Paul tells us we are created for good works, verse 10, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Works do not save us, but we are called and commanded to do good works once we are saved. In fact, God tells us here that he has prepared good works in advance for us to do. Whatever your life circumstances, beloved, if you are in Christ, you can be sure he will provide you ample opportunities for you to obey him, for you to do good works. That sounds great, but trust me, it often takes courage. It takes strength and faith to recognize those opportunities and to follow through. But take heart. Just like the saving faith that we exercise is itself a gift from God, so too is the strength and ability to follow our Lord Jesus in obedience and doing good works. This is what Jesus was talking about when he was speaking to his disciples in John chapter 15. He said this to them, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Abide in me, I abide in you. The branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. God commands us to do good works out of our faith. But that faith and those works are gifts from God. Paul told the believers in Corinth that God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things in all times, you may abound in every good work. He wrote to Timothy that the scriptures are intended to make the man of God complete, equipped for every good work. He wrote in the book of Philippians, and all this, of course, is written to us by extension as well. He told them to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Works, works don't save us, but they do demonstrate the genuineness of our faith. Jesus, again in John 15, said this, By this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. The second chapter of the book of James, of course, is well known, has much to say about works. It says, Faith without works is dead. Just as God's saving grace must result in saving faith, so too saving faith must result in doing good works. It can't be any other way. Lazarus couldn't help but obey Jesus' voice to raise from the dead and come forth from the tomb. And in the same way, all who are truly saved, you and I, if we are God's people, will necessarily obey him. Imperfectly, of course. We still struggle with remaining sin in our lives. We are his workmanship. I sang a little song. Maybe you did too when I was a kid. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon, the stars, the sun, the earth, Jupiter, and Mars. How loving and patient he must be because he's still working on me. We are his workmanship. We are raised to newness of life. We are brought from a state of death into a state of life and salvation, but he's still working on us. We won't obey him perfectly until we are with him in glory. That's why we are called to walk, to walk in these good works. Back in verse 2, we once walked, Paul uses the same word, in trespasses and sins. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. That's how we walked. It defines how we live. But now, now we are called, commanded, and empowered to walk in God's good works. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. Saving grace can only result in saving faith, and saving faith can only result in a lifetime of ever-increasing obedience to God. 
an increasing conformity to the person and the character of our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you received God's saving grace? Do you have saving faith in Jesus Christ alone for your right standing before God? Does your life exhibit a pattern of good works, even tainted with sin as we all are, but always striving more and more to follow him more closely? A 13th century bishop named Richard of Chichester, as he was dying, he prayed this, O most merciful redeemer, friend, and brother, three things I pray, to know thee more clearly, to love thee more dearly, and to follow thee more nearly. That's what it means to live the Christian life. That's what it means to be saved by grace alone, through faith alone. That's what it means to be God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. That's what it means to walk in good works. We are called to work, to exercise faith, to do good works, but all the credit for everything good that we do goes to God and God alone. Our works don't save us. When we look at our works for the basis of our salvation, we despair, rightly so. Even when we look at our own faith as the basis for our salvation, we despair. That's because we know how small and weak we are. We know how small and weak and frail our faith is. Instead, we have to look not to our own faith, but rather to the source of our faith, the object of our faith, Jesus Christ alone and his finished work on the cross of Calvary as the basis for our salvation. That way and that way alone, beloved, lies peace, hope, Confidence, comfort, rest. John Bunyan, of course, was a slave trader. Excuse me, not John Bunyan, John Newton. Was a slave trader who became a Christian. He penned the famous words, amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. We were dead, but God made us alive. We're not saved by our works, but we are saved by God for good works. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, and to the glory of God alone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you that you are the author of salvation. You are the finisher and the perfecter of our faith. We thank you that there is nothing that we can do to earn your saving grace. And we thank you that there is nothing that we can do to put ourselves out of it. Thank you that our salvation, our faith is not dependent upon our good works or our performance in any way. For then we would be lost and hopeless. May we seek to follow you and grow in the grace and knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ, joyfully, obediently, more and more each day of our lives, always relying upon you and you alone for the ability and the strength to do so. It is in Jesus' name and for his sake that we pray. Amen.